again, I think there's a unique, I mean, there's a, when you bring the human, there's an overhead associated with the human, right? You have to provide, you know, oxygen, CO2 removal, uh, waste processing, and food for the human. So there's an overhead of having the human in the system. Um, there's also an, a disadvantage of the human in the fact that we're mobile, we move around, we can bump into wires, we can break cabling, we can break connectors, we can uh, kick things that weren't meant to be kicked, etc. So there's a downside of the human being there that it's an overhead. But then there's an advantage in the fact that you get a very flexible system that can do tremendous in situ data analysis. You know, I, if you go back to the Apollo stuff, if you just landed a rover on the surface with the camera systems we had at the time, could you really do inspections of the rocks to the to the level that you really wanted to, or is it better to actually fly a geologist to the moon or to some other planet that can actually look at the rock and based on their years of experience, determine which rocks are interesting from a geological standpoint, which phenomena is something that's not normal, et cetera. You can do some of that through cameras and other devices, but it's not as effective as actually having the human there, where the human can actually take the knowledge that they have and apply it to the situation and be more flexible and make those critical judgments that are there. So I think there's a need for that human to be on scene. You can do some of it telerobotically, but it's there's a real advantage and cuts the time the time to discovery down if the human is there and can actually be present in that situation. Um, I think there's also a, a good interaction between the two, between robots and humans. We're just starting to learn where robots can be used. Um, one thing I find interesting is uh, uh, Robonaut has a hand, it has an interface with fingers effectively. And then if you look at Dexter, the Canadian robot, it has an industrial tool interface. So we've flown up um, an experiment on this shuttle flight where we're going to put outside a, a mock-up of an outside of a spacecraft. And then we built unique tools for Dexter, an industrial robot, to actually go cut the blanket off, remove screws, pop the cover off, cut the lock wire off, remove the fuel cap on a refueling valve and actually hook up a refueling line to actually transfer uh, propellant eventually to, to a failed spacecraft. So we built unique tools that interface to, um, to Dexter to do that. If you were going to use Robonaut for that same task, the blanket task wouldn't require a special tool because your fingers and hand manipulation could actually help you remove the blanket. But then as soon as you got to the screws, you're going to need a tool even for the Dexter or for the for the R2 hand. So then there's still got to be a tool development, but now instead of interface into an industrial robot interface, it now has to interface to this five digit thing. And that may actually be a more complex tool interface than it would would be to an industrial robot interface. So there's some really interesting things about how the hand helps or doesn't help in certain tasks and is it actually more effective or not. Some of those don't require space demonstrations. They can be done on the ground, but we need to start thinking about as we want to optimize the situation and carry the minimum number of tools to do a variety of tasks, what is the right interface for the robot? Is it the standard industrial tool interface or is it more of a dexterous hand interface? And, and I'm not sure it's clear what kind of task we're going to do, which one of these robots it better fits that situation. So we've got some, I think, some ground analysis that we need to start thinking about how we want to do this in the future and, and how that makes sense. You know, R2 came about because they were looking for the tasks of, uh, in, uh, in auto assembly, they put some sound barriers inside a door panel. And there's a very repetitive task where you have to apply a, a roller and glue around the edge and it, and it causes carpal tunnel syndrome in the human. So, the, so the part of the reason for R2 development was to actually do that task to apply just precisely the right pressure in this motion. And then it obviously doesn't have the same problem humans do with the, with the carpal tunnel problems. But that's where R2 came about from the, from the robot industry. So that was an application where an industrial robot didn't fit as well as having a dexterous robot that could actually get force feedback and actually get sensing back. So I think there's a lot of work we need to do in the robotic area to figure out that right role between the two. And I think it's wrong to say that it's either all human or it's all robot. The right answer is really some combination of the two.